As Americans were told to shelter in place during the pandemic, I couldn't help but to notice that even though we all had to halt everything we were doing, the banks largely continued on as if nothing was happening. They continued to collect on car payments, mortgages, and credit card debts, even as Americans were forced by the government to stop working and stop earning an income. Then on top of this, I couldn't help but to notice that the government and the Fed's idea of reviving the economy is to cut interest rates as usual. This is what they always do. But how does a low interest rate help you when you don't have a job? You're not gonna go buy a house when you don't have a job. Those low interest rates help the rich who are not as affected by the pandemic. They swoop in, they buy your foreclosed on home or business for dirt cheap. And I've been saying it all along, but this has been a wealth heist. And that reality will only become clear in the months ahead when the lost jobs and incomes take its toll. But this economy was on the brink of collapse well before the pandemic hit. We didn't fully fix the problems that led to 2008. And in the fall, we watched the Fed act in strange ways, dumping nearly a trillion dollars into the banks and lowering interest rates when the economy was supposedly booming, something they never do. So it's clear we were in trouble well before the pandemic, but the pandemic is a great scapegoat. Rather than, blame, rather than the blame being placed where I think it belongs on our banking system, they get to say it's the pandemic that caused the economic depression, not them. And we've all heard money is the root of all evil, and I have increasingly become more and more suspicious that the reason the poor are getting poorer, the rich are getting richer, the cost of goods are skyrocketing, and even why we are in endless wars is very much tied to the banks. But it's all very complicated for us lay people to understand just how the current system could be the root of most, if not all, of our problems. So here to help shed some light is Ellen Brown. Ellen is an attorney, chair of the Public Banking Institute, and author of 13 books, including Web of Debt, and her latest book, Banking on the People, Democratizing Money in the Digital Age. Ellen, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, Kim. Great to talk to you. So I, you know, uh, this has been a, a sneaking suspicion of mine for some time, but I've not been able to wrap my mind around it. Uh, feeling like really the more I've researched the wars uh, and, and all of our problems in this country and going into the elections and uh, it, to me the sneaking suspicion is I just think it's the banks the way they make money uh, the now with the cost of everything skyrocketing that the bank can give you a loan for like even education something that's kind of in thin air right uh, suddenly that's cost it costs an outrageous amount of money um, and so I've just had this feeling that the banks are the root of everything. So maybe you can explain, you know, the problem with the Fed. A lot of people have this, for one, we don't even understand it. You know, what is the Fed and where did it come from and why, are, why do you think it is the problem? Okay, well, there are many myths <laughs> attached to banking. The Federal Reserve, most people think that it's federal, so it's, that's in the name. But in fact, it's composed of 12 branches, all of which are 100% owned by the banks in their district, um, that it's basically controlled by the New York Fed. They're, they're the uh, strongest, and that's obviously where Wall Street is, and you know the banks that own the, the New York Fed are the big Wall Street banks. So um, the Federal Reserve has as its mandate to maintain the value of the currency, or the stability of the currency, and supposedly to uh, promote full employment. Um, they don't do a lot for full employment, but be before this crash, we were technically at full employment, but everybody knows we weren't. You know, even when the economy was good, there were lots of people that couldn't get jobs and they just quit looking for, looking for them. Um, so what they basically do is supposedly maintain the stability of the currency, which is defined as um, preventing inflation. So. The argument is that, well, they they got that mandate in the 1970s when we had stagflation. So, um, and there's so many things I could focus on. I'm not sure what you want. <laughs> it's me such to a focus complicated on. issue. I mean, this is why you know, and I'm sure we'll have you back a few times to to kind of shed light on this because this is why it's such a complicated topic and why it's and why they've been able to kind of pull the wool over everybody's eyes for so long is because it is so complicated and there's too many right. there's so many layers to it. Um, I guess, you know, let's start off with in the beginning of the of the nation, our founding fathers didn't want um, a central banking system. Is that right? They were shying away um, from it. Well, originally, you know, the colonies issued their own money directly. And then uh, 
the Bank of England leaned on the king to prevent us from issuing our own money, and this caused a great depression because we no longer had a money supply. It shrunk the money supply. So we went to war, but the, uh, you know, the Re American Revolution, and we won the war just on paper currency that, we, that was just issued. But the problem was, by the end of the war, the currency had devalued so much that it was it was the continental cur currency, and the phrase was not worth a continental. In other words, it was worth nothing. Uh, argued that it was blamed on the Continental Congress printing too much money, but actually they didn't. It was that the uh, British, who were in the harbor with their ships, counterfeiting these notes that were easy, easy to counterfeit at the time and just spreading them all around. So wow. that devalued the currency. Plus the fact that if you're, uh, you have a choice between a paper currency of an army that might not win and gold, of course you're going to take gold. So relative to gold, the currency went down, down, down until it was worth nothing. So, so with the founding fathers who had actually, I mean, this had actually been the basis of our economy was government issued money. We're so afraid of paper money that they left it out of the constitution and technically then gold coins, gold or silver coins, were the official currency. But the problem was we didn't have enough gold. And so uh, the first Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton, set up a bank similar to the Bank of England on the same model where uh, they issued paper notes, US notes, uh, t 10 times as many notes as they had gold because it had long ago been established that people only come for their gold 10% of the time, and so generally banks could get away with that. So originally they, that first U.S. bank was uh, government owned, and then there was a second U.S. bank, but it got privatized, and it, so it was owned by big British bankers, and it got corrupted, and so Andrew Jackson shut it down. So we have a, have a long history of um, private banking, where it was actually the private banks that after we no longer had a central bank, the private banks issued their own bank notes in the same way. It actually had the name of the bank on the top of the note. And so it was a promissory note from the bank to redeem in gold if, if you came for your money. But again, they were issuing 10 times as many notes as they had gold and re periodically, like once every six years, I guess we had a banking crisis because people figured out that they didn't have the gold for one reason. They didn't trust it for one reason or, or another. Mm -hmm. And they would all rush to the banks and try to get their money at the same time. So that's when the Federal Reserve came in. We had a major uh, bank run in 1907. And so the Federal Reserve was set up supposedly to backstop the banks. So they would hold the gold and then the banks could borrow from the Fed. But, such uh, a strange thing, though, right? For the, I mean, to me, that's such a strange idea, just to, the government to say, okay, we're going to give this private company all the gold and let them control the money, a private company. I mean, that to me seems, again, because I don't understand banking fully, so to me that just seems really odd. Yeah, well, people didn't know it was... Um private. It was called the Federal Reserve. Right. Which is very sneaky. I'm very sneaky of them. Exactly. It's everything's been very sneaky for in the last 200 years, actually. In fact, our whole banking system is based on a fraud. And that's why we have this continual scramble for liquidity. The mm -hmm. fraud being that banks don't actually have the money that they lend. They create just create the money they lend on their books. And this used to be, when I first started writing on it, it was considered conspiracy theory, and I had, to, <laughs> I had to fight for it. But in 2014, the Bank of England finally came out and said, contrary to popular belief, banks do not lend their deposits. They actually create deposits when they make loans. So that's where our money comes from. It's Don't you really love that you were called a conspiracy theorist for so long, and then it turns <laughs> out that they finally come out and say, well, no, actually, you weren't. You're, you're right. This is, I mean, that's just the thing that's so frustrating. Yeah, and we got a lot of that going on right now, too. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. So this whole liquidity issue, right now, I, I saw that you did a, a very good podcast on uh, on the whole repo run on the repo market in September. That, too, was a liquidity crisis. That's what, what it's all about. It used to be that for liquidity, see, the banks don't really have the money. So, so if the depositors and the borrowers come for their money at the same time, the bank has to borrow it somewhere else. They can't borrow from their depositors because the depo depositors want the money. 
So they used to borrow from each other on the Fed funds market, and that was the interest rate that the Fed was would control, the, the Fed funds rate. And supposedly that would control the whole market, which obviously it didn't. But anyway, that's that's what they did. And then after 2008, banks were afraid to borrow from each other because nobody knew where the bodies were buried. You know, nobody knew if they were going to get their money back. So they went to the repo market instead, which is like a big pawn shop, but you put up security for the loan and that's the difference. But then the problem was that this collateral is rehypothecated, which is also very complicated, but it can be lent more than once. So again, you don't really know where the bodies are. And in uh, uh, of late, the hedge funds have taken over the repo market and the hedge funds are just the worst for rehypothecated, you know, for magnifying loans, loans built on loans based on the same collateral. So is that kind of like, uh, for us lay people, is that kind of like double booking an airline seat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in the airlines, at least they give you, so, you know, they let you. Right. They can't really have, have two people sitting the on the same, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So they, they lended this out and then, and we saw this crisis in the fall, well before this pandemic yeah. hit. Well, another, I mean, when we had this liquidity crisis to start with, I think the ETFs were, you know, the exchange traded funds, which is what BlackRock deals in. I think they were in trouble in July. I'm just writing about that now because uh, that's another very complicated thing. But exchange traded funds are supposedly uh, very liquid. But the thing is, the thing that they buy underneath them are not liquid. Mm -hmm. And so it works great as long as the market's going up. Everybody loves this liquid thing that they could trade on the stock market. But when the market starts going down for some reason, we had an oil crisis, you know, oil collapse. So when right. things start to collapse, then they don't have the they don't have the ability to sell off the loans that were that are what they're a bucket of, you know, that they're selling to investors. So, so they were in trouble for liquidity. They and they went to the repo market, and then suddenly, you know, the lenders pulled out because they didn't trust the hedge funds, and J.P. Morgan pulled out for other reasons. I mean, the, the banks themselves have tons of liquidity theoretically because of all this quantitative easing that the Fed did with them, giving them all these excess reserves. But the Fed was paying two percent on the excess reserves. And so if it's a choice between lending in the repo market at 2% or taking the Fed's 2%, of course you're going to take the Fed's money. So they just they, they couldn't get them to lend even at higher interest rates because it was just risky or they'd already tied the money up somewhere else like JP Morgan was buying their own stock, that type of thing. Or, you know, just other investments that they were using this money for. So there was a liquidity crunch and uh at the beginning of this uh, COVID crisis, that the ETFs were sinking fast. And then lo and behold, uh, BlackRock got put in charge of four, $4.5 trillion in potential credit from the Federal Reserve. And the first and only thing they've done in, in that market where they're supposed to make corporate loans is to buy ETFs, 50% of which were owned by BlackRock. So a clear scam, and it's just obvious to anybody that looks, but what do we do about it? They are the, BlackRock is the largest, well, they're the largest asset manager in the world, but they're bigger than the largest bank. They're bigger, they're bigger than many countries' economies. I mean, they're just huge. And they've got their tentacles into everything. So our pension funds and, you know, everybody wants them to do well because our money's tied up with them. And if yeah. they crashed, everything crashes. But it's private, as you say, and the private profits are getting directed to the big corporations. That's what they buy are the big corporations loans, not the little corporations. So if any, if they're helping corporations at all, it's the big corporations, which obviously does not help our little Main Street businesses, right. which are going bankrupt right and left. Right. I mean, I got to be honest with you, Ellen. I feel like I'm a fairly intelligent person, but I still don't understand half of really most of what you said. <laughs> I oh, mean, I think okay. it's just so complicated. <laughs> you know, banking yeah. is so complicated. And again, this is how they've been able to pull the wool over everybody's eyes because it's so you have to have you have to be studying this and an expert in it in order to really even understand it. They use these fancy terms and, uh, you know, and it's the systems that are very difficult and it's just so much for us to wrap our minds around that it's like, 
I don't get it. All I know is that, uh, I, you know, all I know is I feel like I'm just getting more and more broke. You know, that student loans are sky high, car payments are sky high. I was asking my dad the other day, he's in his 70s, and I asked him, you know, back when you were first buying your home, what the price of your home, the starter home, was how many, was equal to how many years salary? You know, and he says it was worth three years of his salary was the price of his house. And nowadays it's like you'd have to have five to six or seven times your salary and you'd need two people's salary in order to buy the house. Um, Same thing with a car. You know, back in the day you could buy a car, a brand new car off of a salary that was a minimum wage. You could be working minimum wage, you know, at the fast food restaurant and you could buy a brand new car. And I believe the loan was only maybe two or three years. And now the loans are what, six, seven years, right? And it, it takes, you, and you could never buy a brand new car working at fast food. You have to have a, a, a much higher wage job. So, you know, I, I think we're all feeling this crunch. Um, and it seems really unconscionable that the banks continue to roll on during this pandemic, right? Here we are, we're all told that we can't work, we can't earn money, but the banks continue to collect. Um, I mean, what, how do we solve this problem with the, I mean, the Fed? And I mean, what, what do you think the, the biggest issue is if you had to boil it down with the Fed? What's, what is your problem with the Fed? Well, we actually do need a credit system and we do need a, a deep pocket, a place to get credit. I, my, I'm chairman of the Public Banking Institute and what we're trying to do is to get public banks set up that would be able to drink at this trough. I think it's okay, but it needs to be a public utility and it needs to be directed fairly to everyone equally, or we need to all have equal access to this trough. There was another bailout that they did. They bailed out the banks um, in March, March 15th, uh, the Federal Reserve changed the banking rules and made it so anybody could borrow at the discount window for zero, to 0.25% any bank that was in good standing. Before that, nobody went to the discount window because there, it was at a penalty rate and then that would reduce your credit rating and you know it just was a black mark on your record, so they didn't go there. And now the Fed has dropped the interest rate almost to zero. And why did they do that? It was supposedly to help the businesses, but did they drop the credit card rates? Not at all. They didn't, well, half a percent from 20, you know, the high end of, 21 to the lower end of 21, whereas in Canada, they actually dropped it to 11%. I mean, you, it could be done to, to cut the credit card rates. And we could have like a national public credit card that was at much lower rates. We could have a national public banking system in the post offices that would do basic cash. You know, there are many things we could do. And that's a way to save the post office. Exactly. If we were if it were a public utility, and that and that's what I think it needs to to be, it needs to be totally overhauled. Okay, so tell me, as a, as a normal person, what would be the difference for me? What would my experience be with the public banking system versus what we have now? Well, it would be on two levels. Uh, first of all, there are different ways you could design a public banking system. Probably our best Western model is in Germany, where they have... Um, a public bank in, it's called the Sparkassen Bank, and 40% of the German banking um, assets are with the Sparkassen public banks. So you've got your little local public bank where their business is to lend to small and medium-sized businesses, and supposedly that's the reason that the German economy was so much stronger than, than the other economies in Europe, particularly in you know Southern Europe. Uh, and you could obviously get, well, I, I don't know what they have for credit card. Anyway, their KFW is a big uh, uh, infrastructure bank. So it's a public infrastructure bank. I think we need one of those too, a government infrastructure bank. And they've totally redone their energy systems and it's all been financed through, you know, solar is, I forget, but you know, made, most of their energy is now solar and it was funded by the public banks. And in China, you have a system where uh, the banks are, 80% of banking assets are owned by the government. And when they want to build something like high-speed rail, then they just take out a loan from their own banks, which create the money on their books, just as all banks do. 
And then they, so that's how they were able to build 12,000 miles of high-speed rail in 10 years. They, in China, they don't, they don't have to argue in Congress about where right. we're going to get the money and right. squeeze it out of the taxpayers. They just do it. They just create it and do it. And I saw somebody said that uh, in China, the politicians are engineers. In the U.S., the politicians are lawyers. And we argue about everything. <laughs> Instead of it there, they just decide to do something and they do it. And they yeah. can because they've got the backing of a public banking system that will do things for the public instead of just for the large corporations that own the own the stock market. You know, everything we right. do now, the stock market is really the measure of supposedly the economy, but it's not. We have two economies. We have a financialized economy and a real economy, and they're not doing much of anything for the real economy. Right, right. So with the banks, you know, let's talk about how the Fed, um, how they end up, you know, in my mind, and maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like they're one of the reasons why we're in endless war is because there's so much money to be made off of war and there's so much in debt people go you know nations and uh our nation goes into debt when we go to war right well um it has been said that all wars are bankers wars the banks always um make out like bandits or like take the civil war uh Abraham Lincoln issued his own money directly because if he hadn't, he would have had to borrow at 24 to 36% interest from British bakers. So to avoid that, you know, he issued his own money and, and then we managed to win. But it, if you have to borrow, people are willing to go heavily into debt during war because it's an emergency, just like what we have right now. Right. Um, you know, some sort of crises always serves the banks because... Um, you know, people are just willing to to do that, go go heavily into debt. So you have to go and take out the loan, and then they they issue this loan to you, and they make money off that loan, obviously, and that, because the banks make money off the interest rates. Yeah, and the government goes heavily into debt, and then the banks, particularly like in the U.S., um, we are the global reserve currency, so we can just issue the money. But if you're a third world country, and you have to fight a war and you're desperate for money, you're going to wind up borrowing dollars probably or borrowing from the IMF. If you can, the, if you're not sanctioned like Venezuela. Right. Yeah. And then you get all these string, strings attached. You have to go into austerity. You have to sell off your public assets and um, squeeze your, you know, all, all the public things get squeezed and the taxpayers get squeezed. And Oh, that's interesting. So that that's interesting. So what you're saying is, so if you're a third world country and you need money to fight your war, maybe you're in a civil war or something, you go and you get some dollars, you have to borrow in dollars in order to pay for the war, then you're going to have to sell off. So if you're a country that has oil reserves, and they're nationalized, um, you would eventually you probably would have to privatize and sell those off. Right. So then so then the the international investors, who maybe even let you borrow. So they basically said, okay, you could borrow from us and then we're gonna come back around and we're gonna own your country, at least all the resources. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Wow. And it, you don't even have to be a third world country. I mean, that happened to Greece and uh, yeah. Right, That's so, so that's how a lot of these, and then the countries have to practice austerity with their populations. They almost don't have a choice. Yeah. So, and but we do. It will it could happen with our states because we're we're just like the European Union countries. We don't have our, the ability to issue our own money and we're supposed to balance our budgets. So we have to borrow from the central bank if they'll lend to us. And uh, yeah, just like having to borrow from the EU. Okay, so what would happen? Because this was an argument that was going on during the pandemic when uh, Trump was saying, you know, I'm not gonna bail out some of these liberal states, right? He was saying, I'm not gonna bail out New York. I'm not gonna bail out California after this pandemic, what would happen to New York, for example, if the federal government does not bail out New York, New York starts to go into serious debt, who would, New how would New York sell off its, who would they sell off their, let's say, public assets to, or whatever assets they have, who would they sell those to? Well, I'm sure that's the goal to get, they want the states to go bankrupt so that they can get rid of the pension funds for starters, privatize the pension funds and push them into the stock market, you know, give everybody a 401k and you go in the stock market and then you really don't know how to invest and you wind up 
you know, losing your money and then you blame yourself for buying the wrong stocks. But really what we need is a social safety net. That's what we need. The solution to our problems is a social safety net for everyone. But yeah. for yeah. that, we need a deep pocket. But I, there are ways. Um, but who goes in and buys those things? So it's private investors? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. And so this is where the problem is. The Fed is all, so what you're saying is that the Fed is kind of working on behalf of these private investors because they're not a government agency, even though they're called the Fed, but they're working more for their friends and cronies and deep pockets. Yeah, well, theoretically, they do what they're required to do under the Federal Reserve Act. So really, we should get Congress to change the Federal Reserve Act and allow them to do more than they do. But Congress itself is bought by big money, as we've seen. Right. So, so nobody yeah. wants to change that system. So could yeah, the Fed th be saved? I mean, could we not go to a public banking system, let's say, or have both? Or, you know, is it one or the other? Is it both? Well, here's what we're trying to <laughs> pull off. California, for example, if California had its own bank and, we, and a state-owned bank, or city-owned banks, we have a pretty vibrant movement right now for publicly-owned banks. So assume California had its own bank, it could borrow at 0% interest, just like the, like the banks do. And uh, then it could lend to itself at 0% interest. And these balanced budget amendments are, not every state has them. So it would be possible to change your rules, you know, just go to your legislature and say, in this crisis, we can't possibly balance our, our budget. So we're going to allow ourselves to just carry some debt at 0% interest with our own bank that is, you know, backed by, by our own assets. So in other words, we could play their game. This, we could get the perks that of the, the club that we don't belong to by setting up our own publicly owned banks. Would this mean we get rid of the, so we have the Fed still and we'd have yeah. public banks. So the Fed would still exist. Yeah. And there, there are proposals for the Federal Reserve to open its lending window to everyone. Now, if we all could have an account at the Fed, you know, it would be some sort of digital account. Right. Then it would be more secure, obviously, than Chase or whatever. So everybody would pull their money out of the private banks and put it in the public bank. Well, the and Fed's, but, okay, but the Fed's not it's public. It's not public, right. but let's assume <laughs> okay. that... We could change the law and give it a mandate to serve the public interest, make it. it a public utility. Okay. And if everybody had an account there, so so it's not like you have to even penalize the private banks. All you have to do is set up a better system and everybody will abandon the old system and go for the new. And if we could issue some sort of a credit card, I mean, it seems to me the government could issue one at like half the rate. Well, you could, it could be a lot lower than that. But if you just reduce the rate at all, everybody would use their government credit card. And that that is the basic uh, income source of the big banks now. They don't lend to small and medium-sized businesses. They right. lend on credit cards. Yeah, this is such a, you know, and, and uh, lending is such a, a cycle, especially for those, you know, in the poor areas of the country, poor areas of cities. Um, who are typically people of color, right? They get really screwed over because they don't have good jobs that can pay them a good amount of money to afford to live in the where they need to live. And so they have to take out loans and then when they and then they can't really afford sometimes to pay back those loans because they really aren't making enough money to to live, right? I mean, they're under they're not making living wages. And because of that, they default on their loans, which then only means when they go back to get another loan, what happens, there's interest rates skyrockets. And suddenly that person is paying 25% more, you know, for a good than somebody else. And it just ends up being this uh, crushing cycle that keeps people poor. And, um, you know, and it's interesting with those interest rates you talking about, and I'm thinking, gosh, you know, when I was, a, when I was in college, let's say, and I needed to borrow mon money from my parents, they never charge me interest. You know? yeah. I mean, you go well, to your they, parents, you know, they do it because they love you. They want to see you succeed. And you would think that the government would want that from us as well, that they'd want the American people to succeed. They'd want their citizens to succeed. So they wouldn't be charging or allowing us to be robbed by these banks with these exorbitant interest rates uh, and, and insane loans, you know, and it just keeps – 
the rich richer and the middle class and the poor shrinking because the wealthy don't have to take out so many loans. They get mm -hmm. to buy things in cash, which means they don't pay any interest, but the rest of us do. Yeah. In, in China, because they own most of the banks, um, they just don't worry about defaults. They just write them off. And everybody says, oh, the Chinese banks have all these non-performing loans and they're going to go bankrupt. But they don't. They're, not, they're only going to go bankrupt if they're regulator. They are the regulator. And if they don't put their banks into bankruptcy, they're not going to go bankrupt. And if they don't put the businesses into bankruptcy, they're, they're not. They figure it's better to keep people working, even if it's, you know, not so profitable. And you would think now the bank has created money on its books. It didn't get paid back. So now there's extra money in the system and you would think that would be inflationary, but it's not because you need extra, this is gonna get too complicated, but you need extra money in the system to fill that gap where the bank creates the principal, but they don't create the interest. So debt always goes up faster than the money supply. There's always more debt than there is money available to repay it because they don't create the interest when they create the original loan. So you need some money to, either you have to do a debt jubilee, which you can't really do in, they used to do it in ancient times right. when, they, when the government was the bank, but now it's banks are private or lenders are private. And so you can't just write off all the debts, but what you can do is fill that gap with regular, it could be universal basic income, it could be writing off debts. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to give everybody a free ride. You can still make them go through bank, bankruptcy court and all those things so that they, you know, so maybe it's not so good on their credit rating. You know, it, you can still have some sort of penalty, but... Um, what would happen right now if, because of this pandemic, the government said, you know what, we're gonna do a Jubilee. <laughs> everybody is now debt free except, you know, so, you know, up to a certain amount, uh, what yeah, would what happen? You have, to do, though, you have to compensate the lenders. That's a problem because the lenders, the banks would go bankrupt if you did that under the current system. But if you said, okay, we're going to let the banks not balance their books, we're going to let them just carry non-performing loans like they do in China, that would work. And they could do that. The complaint would be that there would be a lot of extra money in the, in the money supply, but we need that money in the real economy right now. We don't right. need it in the financialized economy. Yeah, I mean, look, I've got friends that are paying $2,500 a month to the banks for student loans. I mean, it's just for going through law school, you know, and that's, yeah. that's, that's not money going into the economy. That's just going to a bank, you know, and yeah. that's, um, that's not helping anybody right now except the banks. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's all very complex and very interesting, but certainly, so so China, I mean, how many countries have sort of the system we have where there's a private Fed and then there's the treasury? Um, theoretically, the, the whole central banking system, uh, the, it's controlled by the Bank for International Settlements, which is private, and it's in Switzerland. And I think there are 55 countries that are members of the Bank for International Settlements. It doesn't include, or didn't include, Libya, Iraq, Iran, uh, you know, Argentina. All those countries have gone after. We're not in the club. But if you're in the club, theoretically, you have a, a central bank that's owned by the government. I, I think we're the only one that has private stockholders for our 12 federal, you know, central bank branches. But they all are really privately owned or controlled. You know, they're still controlled by by the big banks. And well, look at England, for example. Obviously, the city of London controls the UK, even though technically the um, Bank of England is government owned. You know, they're all considered independent. So independent of government means they're not allowed to actually serve the government because that's considered political. And right. They, yeah, this is just all so complicated. But I, but it's clear to me that the big problem, Ellen, is that because we don't understand this, we're not rising up and calling for the change. I mean, we see thousands of people right now marching in the streets for Black Lives Matter. You know, we're seeing people rise up when they're when an issue is put in in front of their face, right? When an issue mm -hmm. is in front of them, and this is something you know. I mean, we see the people in the thousands on Black Lives Matter. We've got. You know, people don't realize it's it's about a dozen, a little under a dozen uh, unarmed black 
men and women who are killed by the police each year. It's about 10 to 12. And yet we see, you know, uh, that are unarmed. We see there's more that are armed that are killed and, uh, you know, and, there, and other races as well. But, the, but we see this issue and how it is mobilized people because the media and there's so much awareness about it that people say this has to stop, right? We can't continue on like this. This must stop because people are aware. But something that is affecting every single last one of us is this banking system that is causing all of our cost of goods to go way up, that is causing our, in a pandemic, when the government says you're not allowed to work, but you still got to pay the bank. Um, this is something that's affecting all of us. And yet, because it's such a complicated system, because people aren't really fully aware of the problem and the fix, and it's not easy to understand, there just isn't that awareness and people aren't rising up. But so it's really clear to me that what needs to happen is somehow this needs to be boiled down into something much easier for the average, you know, Fox News viewer, for example, to understand. Like in, you know, like it's just got to be down to a very basic uh, language and understanding for people to understand it. And, um, you know, and the banks and the big corporations own the media, right. so that's the other reason they don't make a big issue out of it. If they, if they did make a big issue out of it, people would get it. You know, they could even have experts on that to explain this is what's wrong and here's what we need to do and we need to make banking public utility, and people would go for that. They'd probably go out in the streets for it if they got it. Yeah, but if they, they understood how, how, how much this is damaging their lives, how the current system is just reeling us into worse and worse off conditions year after year after year, decade after decade, how each generation is doing worse than their than the generation before them. Um, you know, if, if people really fully understood and that that leads to the crime, that that leads to the animosity and the competition uh, with one another, including racial competition and gender competition and you know it, it leads to all of those things you know when people feel squeezed financially or when they feel like they're fighting for resources they start to other people they start to uh and, and then people get desperate too and they start to and then there's more crime and you know it's like such a ripple effect that if we could just solve this problem we would see our society uh, become a lot safer and more equal for everybody yeah, I agree. Well, one reason you don't see the protests in China is after the, well, the communist revolution is not something we want to go through, obviously. I mean, it's bloody. It was horrible. Right. But, but when they opened up, they had all this land that they could actually give to pe the people. I mean, I mean there, there actually was an, a lot more opportunity. And so even though the rich are getting richer in China, the poor are getting richer, too. Right. So they're all really getting rich right situation. now of a rising tide lifting all boats, whereas right. that's not happening here. No, I mean, here it's a it's a wealth heist. I mean, people are just being robbed and the middle yeah. class is shrinking. And, you know, it, it's just, it's becoming insane. It's just insane. So, the, you know, the idea, I, I look back at my childhood and my uncles that were, you know, most of my aunts were stay-at-home wives and had three or four kids. And my uncles worked blue-collar jobs. I mean, I had an uncle that was a dry cleaner man. You know, he would go and pick up the dry cleaning and drop off dry cleaning. And he was able to support a wife and three kids in a nice middle class home. Or my mm -hmm. other uncle did sprinklers. Same thing. He had a wife, a stay-at-home wife and four kids and in a middle class home. You know, I mean, it, those days are gone. Nobody can do that now. Yeah. And, you know, people I have to kind of open their eyes to that and, and get angry. Yeah. I know somebody who... Um was born in the 20s, I think. <laughs> anyway, he said in the 30s, he said you could actually, he and a friend hitchhiked around the country and you could work for a night doing dishes and pay your hotel bill and have a meal and have breakfast and move on. I mean, wow. there's no way you could do that today. No, there's no way you could do that now. You could not pay for your hotel room. You could barely pay for your meal if you're washing dishes. Yeah. So... Um, I, you know, this is definitely a big topic and there's a lot to break down with it and it is very complicated. And I, you know, I, you're doing a great job. I, I have your book web of debt and I plan on reading it. I actually got the audio version of it. So I need to actually get the, uh, and I tried, but I'm, I'm terrible with audiobooks, So I'm actually going to get the book physically 
and read it because this is such a big and important topic and I want to try to help as much as I can share, shed light on the issue so that Americans, can, in, in simpleton terms, so that everybody could get it, right? Because they use all these complex terms and systems and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So that everybody could understand it, so that we can move, because I do believe that the public banking system, you know, intuitively, I just feel like something's very broken. And yes, if we had banks that actually worked on behalf of the people, kind of like when you go to your parents and you'd say, mom and dad, I need help. And they would help you because they want you to succeed. And they don't try to then rob you and say, well, you know what, kid, you know what I could be doing with that money instead of helping you out is I could be investing it. So you're going to have to pay me what I would be making plus. Right. And that's kind of the system we've got going on now. So um, thank you for being on the show and trying to explain this very complicated situation, <laughs> this <laughs> complex. Yeah, uh, they, they make it complicated in pur on of course. purpose because we're not supposed to understand and we're supposed to leave it to the experts and yeah. it really does take dig digging i mean i really have to dig to figure it out as well and then i try to write it as clear as i can it's kind of like law and accounting also i feel like they keep these things very complicated so you have no choice but to hire an accountant you have no choice but to hire a lawyer you know yeah, i am a lawyer but <laughs> there are two types of legal writing my, my ex-husband was a there's the kind where you use three words instead of one, like be by, uh, devise, bequest, to bequeath, you know, that you're trying to make it complicated. Right. And that's what he did, securities law. And But litigators, I actually worked for the court for my first job. And so you've got to hit them between the eyes, you know, like yeah. straight up front. you got to be clear, succinct, prove your case. All that. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, well, Ellen, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Uh, uh, thank you. Ellen Brown, You're she co-hosts. Thank you. Ellen uh, Ellen Brown co-hosts a radio program on PRN FM called It's Our Money. And you can also read her 300 plus blog articles and get access to her books uh, at ellenbrown.com. And I'll put that link down below. Ellen, thank you again.